Hey everybody, Nicholas Ward here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. As always, I'd like to say thank you for stopping by and say that I really appreciate your support. With that in mind, I do ask that you please like this video and any other videos on this channel that you watch. And more importantly, please subscribe to the channel. Doing those two things will help me uh, to continue to grow the channel to get more views, uh, therefore more money, and therefore uh, to be able to dedicate more time and energy towards creating more content for this channel. Uh, today I'll be talking about my port my personal portfolio. Uh, every month I give a portfolio review, and that is what this video will be about. If you've seen those uh, reviews before, this will be quite similar. I haven't been very active uh, during the month of November. As I've said in recent videos, uh, you know, I think the market's pretty uh, expensive these days, pretty irrationally so. Uh, I think a lot of the exuberance around the recent vaccine news and this sort of reopening rally that we've seen play out during the month of December, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, you know, when I look at the mar market from a macro perspective, I do, uh, you know, see what appears to be stocks trading at multiples that imply uh, that they're already pricing in growth that is two to three, sometimes even four and five years down the road. Uh, you know, to me, that is uh, just way too speculative. And as a conservative value oriented investor, I'm not interested in sort of chasing that momentum and, uh, you know, just playing those sorts of games with my hard earned money. Uh, instead of doing so, I've just been essentially sitting on my hands. Uh, you know, I am overweight equities. I, uh, due to my dividend growth strategy, that I adhere to. I'm essentially always over eight equities. Equities is how I generate my passive income stream and therefore, uh, you know, selling them would sort of be counterproductive uh, to my goals. So uh, during, uh, excuse me, rallies like this, regardless of whether or not I think that they're rational or not, I do tend to benefit and uh, I'm obviously pleased about that. Uh, but before I talk any more, I, I do need to give my quick disclaimer here and say that I'm not a financial advisor. I am an investment analyst with Wide Moat Research, uh, and therefore, I am not offering financial advice in this video and on this channel. I work for the Dividend Kings, for iREIT, and for the Intelligent Dividend Investor. However, I do not manage client money, and therefore, anybody thinking about putting their own capital at risk in the markets needs to do uh, their own due diligence and to understand the risk that they will be, uh, you know, uh, putting themselves. Uh, at by doing so. Uh, the chart that we have on the screen here is my uh, personal dividend income chart. As you can see on the top right hand side of the legend, it goes all the way back to 2014. At the end of every month, I calculate how many dividends I've received and I put that income into uh, you know the Google sheet that I've been maintaining for uh, you know nearly six years now. Excuse me, nearly seven years now. It's been a uh, you know a wonderful journey, as you can see now. The blue line all the way to the left of these months is uh, was my income back in 2014. Uh, I've obviously grown quite a bit since then, and I continue to grow um, overall. And that's the the general goal of dividend growth investing to uh, generate a reliably increasing income to reinvest that income. Uh, and then therefore to compound that income, which uh, organically compounds on its own due to the fact that the companies that I own and that I focus on uh, as a dividend growth investor uh, raise their, dividend, their dividends on their own, uh, just giving me another sort of avenue uh, of compounding. Um, so let's see, I did take some notes here with regard to my performance during the month of November, it was a, a great month, and arguably, I don't um, have long-term data with regard to like my best monthly performances, but I was up 11.2% during the month, my overall portfolio, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's my best all-time month. That was uh, the best November that the market's seen in quite some time, uh, the best month that we've seen um, you know, since the March and April recovery. I don't remember exactly how I kind of fared during that. Maybe I did have another double digit month earlier in the year, but needless to say, uh, I'm very pleased with 11.2% total returns. That is greater than the S&P 500, which was up roughly 10.75%. And uh, that does mean on a risk adjusted return, I'm doing even better because I did, um, you know, I hold roughly 6% cash. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm just very pleased with the way that my holdings are performing uh, during the month of November and during the year. Uh, for the year, uh, at the end of November, I was up 17.95%. Uh, that's overall total return, and that does, uh, once again, exceed the S&P 500's uh, performance during the year. I went and looked at the Spider S&P 500 Trust ETF, which is ticker symbol SPY, 
and including its dividend payments, uh, that was up 14.25% at the end of November. So uh, I was up, uh, you know, what is that, roughly you know 3.5% um, above that, so or 3.75%, excuse me. So that is uh, pretty good. And also I did note that the Spider um, S&P 500 ETF has finished paying its dividends for the year, and the fact that I obviously will receive a large uh, chunk of dividends in December, plus whatever sort of returns that the, my portfolio generates, leads me to believe that uh, my sort of outperformance should uh, continue to grow on a relative basis to, to the SPY. So that is uh, really good. December is traditionally one of my largest months uh, of the year in dividends. This year, it may struggle a bit due to the fact uh, that Disney did decide not to pay its second half dividend. That is a problem for me. And, uh, and I have sort of addressed that problem in a recent trade. I have trimmed my Disney stake by roughly, uh, I think, another 17%. Um, in the beginning of the month, I will uh, post an article and a video about that trade on this channel uh, and on Seeking Alpha shortly. But today, we, we're not focused on that trade. We are focused on uh, my November performance. So um, with regard to my passive income specifically, as you can see here, the pink line is well above the light blue line from last year. Uh, this outperformance, my year-over-year -year growth was up 26.61%. That is uh, just a amazing performance for me. That's uh, the best month with regard to dividend growth that I've had all year. This is primarily due to the fact that I have been adding pretty aggressively to AbbVie throughout the year and uh, even towards late uh, 2019, and AbbVie did pay its dividend this month. I didn't receive those AbbVie dividends or very much of them uh, in 2019, and I did receive them in 2020. Same thing with Bristol Myers, uh, and then same thing with uh, Apple and a couple other you know of the large companies that I own. They did pay dividends this month, and they have increased their dividends uh, since the last time since last year. So uh, once again, up 26% with regard to passive income year over year. That um, is well above my target. But I don't manage my portfolio on a month-to-month -month basis with regard to passive income. I just kind of, uh, you know, I do think of it on a yearly basis. A year to date, I'm up 11.66% uh, with regard to the dividends that I've received compared to the first 11 months of 2019. So that is essentially in line with my uh, performance goals. I just target kind of low double-digit uh, annual dividend growth, and I have been able to kind of keep up with that pace historically, uh, which I am pleased, uh, you know, to be able to do. That means that I will essentially be doubling my in passive income every seven years or so. And uh, that's sort of the basic formula that I use to uh, track my uh, retirement goals and uh, my eventual financial freedom. I should note, uh, this is something that's asked all the time, so I'll go ahead and note it here, that uh, when I'm talking about this 26% dividend growth uh, year over year, it is all organic. I have not added any new funds to my portfolio in 2020. I haven't actually added new funds to my portfolio, I think, since like late 2016. Uh, my wife went to grad school, and then we had a baby, and then the, the pandemic hit, and then we've been doing some sort of uh, home refurnishing. So a lot of things have kind of popped up in the last uh, three years or so, which have led to me not um, adding savings to the account. So all of the growth that you've seen uh, here with regard to the blue and the, the pink lines on the chart are due to strictly active management, which is uh, selling high, buying low, selling high, buying low, etc. cetera, uh, generating more incomes uh, that way. You know, every time you sell high and then you buy low, generally speaking, I make sure that I am increasing my passive income. That has been a good system for me. I don't trade aggressively, but I do trade opportunistically. Uh, and I do just factor in my passive income every time that I make a trade. And then also, as we've uh, you know seen on a monthly basis, I do reinvest my dividends. And then I also uh, receive those organic dividend increases. So it is possible to generate this strong double digit uh, dividend growth without having to put you know large amounts of capital to work uh, in the market. That is something that, that that people ask me and that uh just I guess looking back over the past several years, I have been able to uh, generate the double digit target that I have without having to add new capital uh, to do so. I do look forward to hopefully being able to add new capital to my portfolio in 2021. I'm kind of waiting to pay my taxes uh, since I work as a uh, self-employed individual. I do have a pretty large tax bill. Uh, usually each year. So once I see what that is, and once I write that check uh, to Uncle Sam, I will probably be, uh, you know, being aggressive with my uh, checking account, putting that into the market. Uh, you know, in over the coming 12 months, due to the fact that my wife and I have finally kind of settled into a uh, situation where we're saving money, we're both working again. She's done with school. 
you know, no, no big medical expenses regarding the, uh, the baby. So, uh, you know, life is good and I'm very blessed and grateful for that. And I am looking forward to, uh, being able to, uh, you know, just add some more, uh, money to my portfolio and to sort of juice or accelerate my dividend growth with those, new funds as well. Um, let's see, another question that I usually have here on these kind of review videos is what is my portfolio's dividend yield and then also what is my yield on cost? So I did go ahead and write those figures down. At the end of November, my portfolio was yielding roughly 1.92%. Uh, so that is slightly more than the S&P 500. And uh, that's generally my goal. As I've said before, I look for higher dividend growth in the S&P 500, a higher dividend yield in the S&P 500. Uh, and historically speaking, I've found that if I'm able to focus on my income and sort of maintain those two things on a sustainable basis, uh, due to the fact that to, to get the higher yield, you usually have to invest in, you know, highly low valued stocks, excuse me, attractively valued stocks. And then to uh, grow the dividend at a faster rate sustainably, you have to be owning companies that have, uh, you know, strong and reliable growth when you combine value and growth. It tends to lead to outperformance, which is what um, I'm seeing through 2020. It's what I've seen throughout my investing career. Uh, as I've said before, 2020 is looking to be uh, like it's going to be the seventh out of the last uh, nine years that I have outperformed the market. This uh, you know should add to that streak, so I am very pleased about that. I also note that my yield on cost is 3.49% um, overall. That's not really something that I track, but that is something that people like to uh, no, for whatever reason. So yeah, the yield on cost on my portfolio is 3.49%. I guess you guys have been looking at this graph enough. This is also the same data. This is just another way to show it. Uh, as you can see, you know, like, like I've said before, this is just the long-term growth of my uh, month dividends on a month-to-month -month basis. The red line is the trend line. As you see, that is sort of turning up uh, at a somewhat exponential basis, this will steepen over time uh, due to the compounding process. It's just the nature of compound interest, and that is the reason that I am a dividend growth investor. So uh, I very much look forward to seeing you know where this red line is in you know a decade or so. And uh, until then, I will just patiently stick with the plan and uh, continue to do what I do with regard to uh, value investing and uh, in the highest quality dividend growth stocks that I could find. I should also note that I have um, sort of blanked out the uh, the axis over here. I'm not interested in sharing my wealth uh, with strangers on the internet, so to, please don't take that personally. I, I don't do it on YouTube. I don't do it on Seeking Alpha. I don't do it uh, at the Intelligent Dividend Investor. Uh, none of the services that I manage, uh, my subscribers or um, followers get to know uh, the extent of my wealth. That just doesn't make sense to me uh, with regard to my family's privacy, so I do ask that you please respect that, but I do always, um, you know, talk about trades on a percentage basis, which does allow you to uh, kind of understand the risk that I'm taking, at least relative to the rest of my holdings and, uh, and just to follow along if you do choose to do so. Um, let's see, the last thing that I need to do, I do have my portfolio here and I'm happy to share that with everybody. This is the article that I published on Dividend Kings, obviously. Uh, this is an exclusive article, so you guys don't get to read the text, but I am happy to sort of scroll down through, uh, you know, my portfolio and then uh, some of the trading information to give that uh, to the YouTube community. So uh, let's see, I only made one trade in a month. I did discuss that um, on this channel. That was when I bought Lowe's um, a couple weeks ago at, at 49.80, 149.80, excuse me. Uh, I thought Lowe's was cheap. It's a great dividend growth name, and I was pleased to buy it into weakness. Uh, the only other trades that I made during the month, as you can see here, I do buy ARK uh, shares of the five actively managed ARK Invest ETFs uh, just about every week. I did skip the first week of November because I bought twice in the last week of um, October due to the sell-off that we saw there. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I do like to take advantage of uh, weakness opportunistically when I see it. I saw that at the end of October and I capitalized on that and gave myself a week off. Uh, since this, the funds moved higher uh, in the aftermath of that sell-off. But these are the ARK Invest purchase prices that I locked in uh, on the 13th, the 20th, and the 27th of November. I just buy shares every Friday, and that's how I'm building those positions. As I said, in that article, I do uh, like. They don't pay dividends, obviously. None of those funds do, but they do, they do give me exposure and actually unique exposure uh, in my opinion, to the sort of disruptive te tech markets. And since I'm relatively young, I'm 30 years old, I do want exposure to uh, 
uh, those types of companies. I really like Kathy Wood and her team, and I've been very pleased uh, with the performance uh, of the ARC funds in the short time that I've owned them. So uh, I have no plan to can, to sort of end this process. I'll just dollar cost average into uh, each of these five funds up here every week uh, for the foreseeable future until I have uh, filled out those position sizes. Uh, the only other trades that I made during the month were the reinvestments that I discussed um, for last month. This is a you know a month old, obviously. So I bought BAM at thirty, Federal Realty Investment Trust at seventy one oh two, uh, National Retail Properties at thirty three oh nine, Avalon Bay Communities at one forty four forty eight, Merck at seventy six fifty three, Lowe's at one fifty nine fifty two, Johnson and Johnson at one thirty eight oh three. Raytheon Technologies at 5546 and AbV at 8818. Um, those uh, the market has obviously rallied quite a bit since um, you know the, the very start of the month of November. So I'm up uh, you know uh, quite a bit on all of those trades. Uh, that is the benefit of of uh, sort of dollar cost averaging and reinvesting your dividends is that even when you think the market the market's expensive, sometimes it can get even more expensive. And when you buy shares throughout uh, on a regular kind of scheduled basis you do uh, oftentimes get the benefit over the long term the market does move higher more much more often than it moves lower and that's why i continue to reinvest my dividends even though you know i do fear that the market is overvalued so with all that being said uh, this is my portfolio if you guys have seen uh, these videos or read my articles before there's not much difference um, the only you know trades that i made i just discussed are the cost basis of the vast majority of these uh, positions has not changed. Their weightings haven't changed much. Um, Apple is still by and large my largest holding. Uh, Microsoft is still a pretty heavy weighting. Uh, scrolling through these, BlackRock's had a really good month. Um, it's over $700 a share now, so this is a, it actually saw a pretty nice increase in its weighting um, since the end of uh, October, the last time I posted one of these. Um, scrolling through here, I'll just scroll through slowly if you're new or if you kind of want to get a sense of what I'm holding. Uh, I guess I should note ticker symbol. Uh, we all know that this is my cost basis. Uh, you know, like I said, I've been investing since uh, dividend growth investing since like 2013. So a lot of these positions are very long term positions, and therefore I do uh, have pretty low cost basis. That's sort of the benefit of buying and holding high quality companies um, instead of attempting to trade in and out of them. So uh, that is sort of the type of investing that I. Uh, do and that I think people probably should also do themselves. Uh, I think trying to time the market is a risky business. I much prefer just to focus on time in the market and uh, the compounding of the passive income that all of these positions generate. Uh, these are all what I consider to be core dividend holdings, which uh, pretty much just means a yield that is less than uh, like four percent or so, and that that dividend that generates dividend growth uh, that is less than ten percent. And that's my future expectations. A lot of these companies have generated double-digit dividend growth in the past, but when I look forward, that's sort of the uh, long-term kind of uh, expectations that I have. These are the high-yielding portions of my portfolio. Uh, as you can see here, overall, high-yield makes up 16% of my holdings at the end of the month. Um, AT&T has been my largest high-yield position for a while now. I owned a bunch of Time Warner uh, when they acquired it, and then uh, those shares got turned into AT&T shares. So... Uh, AdV, as I said, this has pretty much uh, been built in the last 18 months or so. I think this stock is very cheap, and I've been happy to accumulate this pretty large position for me. Uh, scrolling down through here, I don't think there's really anything new. I've been adding to my REITs pretty heavily throughout 2020. WPC, I own this large position coming into the year, but I have been able to bolster uh, my realty income, my store, my FRT, my NNN, and then I initiated ESS and AVB during the year. So uh, I have been investing uh, a lot in the real estate space. It's where I've seen value, and I've been happy to do that. Uh, high dividend growth. These are companies that I expect to generate uh, double-digit and pretty consistent and strong double-digit dividend growth uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so, And this month, actually, Broadcom, due to the strong performance of the stock, did hop above Visa. Visa has been my largest uh, stock and position in this in the high dividend growth section of my portfolio for quite some time now, uh, but at Broadcom uh, did jump above it, so that was an interesting move for me. I have no uh, reason or kind of desire to trim this, as you can see. My call basis is pretty low. Uh, I'm not even sure where Broadcom trades today. Let's see. Uh, 
let's see, at, at basically 4.11, uh, so uh, nearly a double up there, and that's part of the reason why it's doing so well. I'm not, I have no desire to trim, and as long as Broadcom continues to give me the strong dividend growth that it has um, in recent years. As you can see, I do own some non-dividend payers. Uh, Google's actually one of my largest positions. I guess it's actually my second largest. Let me scroll up. Microsoft is at 4.1, and Alphabet is at 4.7. So Alphabet is now my second largest position. This company has done quite well um, in recent months as well. Amazon and Facebook. I initiated Facebook in March. Amazon I've owned for years, uh, as you can see by this cost basis. I haven't really added uh in quite some time, I'll just plan just to kind of hold and let that uh, position continue to grow. As you could see, uh, the ARC funds are in this category and they're all very small weightings. Uh, I do plan to continue to buy those until they're all weighted uh, roughly a half of a percent. That would mean that ARC overall is at uh, two and a half percent, which would make it an, an, an overweight position for me. And that's kind of where I feel comfortable uh, with that disruption weighting. Uh, lastly, we ar arrive at the special circumstance category. These are names that um, basically their dividends don't meet uh, the dividend growth expectations that I have relative to their yield. Uh, for instance, Constellation Brands has a low yield, but it also offers low dividend growth, um, you know, as of like kind of 2019, 2020. Uh, same thing for Roper, which is a company that I actually initiated in the month of December. Uh, it's the most recent trade that I made. This was a part of... Uh, this was one of the stocks that I bought with the proceeds from my uh, recent Disney trim. Uh, you can see, even though I trimmed Disney, it's still one of my largest positions. That's why I trimmed it. Uh, it didn't make sense for me to have such a large position uh, that wasn't paying a dividend any longer. Uh, Disney probably will reinstate that dividend at some point in time, but uh, I don't know when that's coming. So in the meantime, uh, I'm happy to sell it sort of here at the highs around 150. I locked in, you know, I think like a 50 or 60 percent gains on those shares. And I have uh, redistributed those funds throughout my portfolio uh, to stocks that do generate passive income and that do generate uh, reliably growing income. Also in this section, you'll see is uh, Carrier Otis and uh, Viatris. I think that's how you say that. Uh, this was recently spun off from Pfizer. These two were spun off from United Technologies. These are small positions. It's, uh, you know, when the shares are spun off, um, you know, from... Uh, you know, the companies that I own, I generally hold them for a while and watch them uh, before I sell them. The idea of spinoffs, uh, hopefully, is that management believes that doing so will unlock value. Uh, that has been the case. All of these companies are trading much higher than their cost basis. So uh, even though they're small positions, I have uh, pretty solid gains on all three of these already. And uh, I may trade those, you know, liquidate them at some point in time and just reallocate them towards uh, what I would consider probably higher quality names. But in the meantime, I am happy to hold. You can also see that cash represented uh, roughly 6% of my portfolio at the end of November. So that uh, is, is everything for this month. That's the portfolio review. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know that uh, people just like to follow along. They like to see uh, what the what their sort of uh, favorite writers and analysts and uh, you know talking heads, for lack of a better word, uh, own. They like to see that uh, people like me are putting their money where their mouth is. Uh, you know, when, when I'm talking about a stock, I generally own it or I am seriously considering owning, owning it. Um, and, uh, you know, doing these videos and the articles that I write, it's usually a part of my due diligence process. Uh, you know, I find that if I'm able to write a, uh, in-depth and cohesive article about a company, I generally understand it well enough to invest in it. So, um, I think that's going to be it for this month. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm happy to answer any questions about my portfolio, about my investing strategy, uh, in the comments section. And like I said, just please uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, doing those two things will help me to grow. And uh, I think subscribing does sort of allow you to follow along easier. It gives you notifications uh, and whatnot when I post uh, new content. So I wish uh, everybody a great Monday. Uh, let's see, I'm recording this Saturday night, but I'm probably not going to post it until Monday uh, because my weekend views typically aren't so good. So uh, you know, I, I, hopefully you had a great weekend. Hopefully the trading week gets off to a nice start from you. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and, uh, until next time, I wish everybody all the best. Thank you. Bye.